Well, I did it, guys. I was the first one to get John Chung on a podcast. I beat Andrew Coates and Dean Guido to it. So I'm just going to pat myself on the back here. I don't know if you can hear that, but I'm not, uh, not gloating in it or anything. Anyways, moving right along. There was a time when I was looking for different gyms to work at and putting out my resume, stuff like that. And on several occasions, it got suggested that I should just go independent and work under Evolve. And I remember thinking like I wasn't, well, I was not established yet. Like I didn't really have any clients that I was working with at that point. And it was scary. Um, so then I started my fitness journey or like my, my career working at a gym and then made my jump later on, like eight months, eight months in. And I kind of started up at raising the bar training and performance and the boys there treated me really well. Um, have nothing but good things to say about them. But then I went to a Lululemon event and I knew about John Chung before seeing him at a few things that Yeg Fitness put on and stuff like that. But, uh, this Lululemon event was a bunch of guys and that were into fitness that we all got together and we did a, a workout at ethics and then we got a presentation done by Jared Smith and we had some beer and pretzels and it was just like my my kind of event and John got talking to me and he was like well why don't you come work at Evolve and you know we got talking about it and I, I had this feeling that it was only a matter of time and then went for a tour I was talking to Andrew too Andrew Coates and that's kind of it's kind of how our worlds collided, but this will give you some backstory to what John's all about and what his favorite video games are and the story of Evolve and where it's going to go in the future, which is pretty exciting. He's a smart guy, super nice, so give this a listen and share it. Thanks for supporting the podcast and I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the Lifestyle Chase. This podcast features high performers who have found a way to live their best life while balancing their health, wellness, friends, and family. Proudly hosted by me, Chris Little. Without further ado, let's get started. Welcome to episode 47 of the Lifestyle Chase. I am joined by the one and only John Chung. How are you doing? Fine, how are you? I'm excellent. How does your day start? Like, what do you do first thing? Uh, I, uh... Wake up around 5.30, uh, sometimes 5, sometimes 6, depending if I watch too much TV. <laughs> <night. laughs> uh, have a bowl of cereal, go on my phone, check uh, news or any events or any emails that I got over the night, uh, and then head into work. And then on the drive, I just kind of plan out my day, what I need to do, look at my schedule, uh, and then I come in the office and I put my headphones in and work. Nice. Yeah. What's something that just has to happen every day for you? What's a non-negotiable for you? Uh, I set a goal that I have to work on one, uh, at least one, but typically my goal is just one, one thing uh, or task that will build the business. So working on the business, not in the business. So that's my one requirement for myself is just to work on one thing. Nice. Mm -hmm. So... What what's kind of like your origin story? And I'm gonna like go back quite a ways. What kind of a kid were you in high school? Were uh, you a jock? No, I was a, <laughs> I was a nerd for sure. Uh, I was good at sports, but I never pursued it. Like I played uh, soccer and hockey, but only until about grade eleven. And then I uh, played a lot of video games, tons of video games. Um, until university and on until I, until I made the gym really uh, well I, I still play video games from time to time but yeah high school for sure I was a nerd what was your favorite video game to play uh, World of Warcraft was really really awesome I played that in I think the first semester of Grand Mac and I was really happy that I didn't re like have it on a credit card that I had to go in uh, to like GameStop and buy a card oh yeah because I skipped so much class to play World of Warcraft and then when I had to renew it I was like ah I'll put it off put it off put it off and I didn't renew it which is good yeah uh, so my marks went up substantially <laughs> but that was good uh, I really like playing PUBG okay yep what's PUBG uh, player battle player unknown battleground or one of the two yeah it's similar to uh, 
uh, kind of similar to Fortnite. Okay. Um, it was really popular last year. Nice, yeah. nice. So you went to Grant McEwen. Is that like the first thing you did out of high school? Actually, uh, out of high school, I needed to upgrade okay. uh, a few classes. So I upgraded uh, two classes. Then I went to Grant Mac uh, in the science program because I wanted to learn about the body, but didn't know that science was more environmental science. So I took you know chem and bio, uh, but it was environmental biology and cellular biology, which I didn't like. Uh, so then I figured out that phys ed was what I wanted to do more so from physiology. So I took some of the classes and then I moved on to U of A to finish my undergrad. Nice. Mm -hmm. If I did a survey when you were like 16 years old, would you ever expect yourself to be like the owner of Evolve, like a, a gym like this that's growing so quickly? No. Um, <clears throat> I made a, like a, a promise to myself never to open a business because um, my parents own a candy store. They bought it for my whole life. It's a small candy store on the north side and it's a mom and pop shop, too small to have a lot of employees. So my parents worked and still own it and still work at it. And just seeing the life dynamic, life, uh, like work-life balance. Um, there are times I wouldn't see my mom uh, for like four or five days just because she would work at her day job and then go work at the store at night. And then as we're kids, we go a bit early. Uh, so I just saw all this work and work and work and work. So I thought, ah, that's a crazy, awful work-life balance. So I said no. So what was your plan? Like, what, what were you going to do instead of, like, opening a business? Um, I, well, out of university, I worked for the... I worked, I worked for the university, training all their athletes. Uh, I then went on to work for the Eskimos and then the police. So it was always keeping in the strength conditioning world. Uh, and then working with the police, I was a training specialist, so I did uh, all their fitness testing for all their members, as well as their recruit training. So I really enjoyed that. Uh, so I always thought it was going to be corporate or sport related, but never own my own thing. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. So with your parents owning their business, like you must have learned quite a bit from them. What are like three three qualities that really stand out to you about how your parents raised you or different skills that you got from them? It would be work ethic, uh, is that you have to work. Because uh, my parents would work. Well, my mom worked two jobs. My dad worked the store, but he worked really long hours and they always work weekends. Uh, so it was always just work, work, work. So my mom would work 12 hours a day for, uh, well still, like 20 years. So just constant work that if you have to do it, you have to do it. Uh, so that was a big one. Um, discipline with that, uh, knowing that you, you just had to do it. So if someone called in sick, it was you had to do it. It was your responsibility. And that's, that's what really kind of stuck towards me. Like they didn't, they didn't blame anyone else for what they did or if the store uh, had to be manned. Like, well, this is our, our doing. Uh, we chose to run a candy store, so um, this is what we have to do. Those would be like the two. I, I can't really think of a third. That's fair. Yeah. So you've applied some of that to your own business, but then you're also like a family man. Like you, you want to be around family and stuff like that. What are some ways that you maintain sort of that, that balance for other people who are starting their business? Uh, the biggest thing, um, so when I decide to open this business, I said I, only, I would only open a business big enough that I wouldn't have to work at it. So at my parents' store, you just need one employee at a time. Um, so it now becomes, if they're not making enough revenue, then they're going to work. So if I was gonna make a business, it had to be big enough that I could step, step away and have employees, which I have employees here. So whenever I tell personal trainers, you know, if you wanna make it big, you know, work as hard as you can at the beginning, but hire someone as fast as humanly possible and actually run a business. Um, so, well, I was listening to podcasts. Well, I sometimes listen to podcasts. Um, and one of the big ones that I remember listening to was the difference between a small business owner and entrepreneur. Um, and everyone calls themselves entrepreneurs, but they're actually all business owners for the most part, small business owners. So I would classify all personal trainers as a small business owner. Um, that if you have to work at your job every single day, you don't own a business. You own a job or you, or you buy yourself a job until you can sleep all day and still make money you just you're just running a small business um, 
So I always tell trainers, if you want to make it big and you want a real business, you need to hire people under you to actually make passive income. Because if you're only making active income, the biggest fear that no one thinks about is what if you get in a car accident? Or what if you go snowboarding and you break a leg and you can't do your job, you're going to be out of money. So you're always trying to tell them, think about the worst case scenario that if you are out uh, and if you're married or if you have kids, if you're, you're banking that you will be healthy. And that's the biggest fear. That uh, if you are picking that you're healthy and shit hits the fan and you're not, then you're you're fucked. Yeah. Makes sense. Mm. What's the toughest thing that you've ever had to encounter? Like, you may not have had a car crash. Maybe you have had a car crash. What what's something that really just like threw you off and you had to? It was like your TSN turning point. Uh, nothing physical. Um, I, I would say the biggest turning point was um, I realized it after it happened. So with the police, I got fired because um, I wasn't a good employee. I didn't realize at the time because I was trying to do everything that was best that I thought would be um, for the fitness unit, but others just didn't see it that way. Um, and then later on, I just realized, actually, I'm probably, I'm probably a shitty employee, and that's why I didn't do well at a big corporate job, uh, and I'm better working on my own. From b- graduating U of A and then going into personal training, you're pretty much your own boss. And then you go, and when I worked at the Eskimos, pretty much your own boss as well. You have a set schedule, but you're working by yourself. And then you, and I went into um, the police when I was a full employee, and that's where I had a lot of difficulties uh, managing expectations because I would just say what it was on my mind uh, and you can't do that in a big corporation so that was a realization that uh, I'm better by myself than under someone what was the day like when you first opened up evolve like what what did everything look like what was the setup what was when did you start when did you finish um, so <clears throat> we opened it the upstairs so this building has two floors upstairs wasn't complete uh, there's still massive rentals. Uh, there's still rentals happening in the front end. So the only thing that was open was the gym. And uh, I had a like a folding Costco table in the gym uh, where I was on my laptop and I had people just signing in there. Um, and there's a lot of equipment here now, but when we first opened, there was no turf. There was uh, one squat rack four squat stands, uh, 10 platforms, and some dumbbells, and three benches. So it was maybe a quarter, even less than a quarter of the equipment. And I thought it looked so cool. Uh, And people (laughs) came and uh, I I gave them a free week uh, so people could try it, whatever they want. And it was crazy how busy it was, but it was bare bones nothing. Uh, My day, Pretty much was I sat there at that table checking people in, watching people in the gym. Uh, from the hours weren't 6 a.m. to 10 at the beginning, it was 8 until 10. Um, and then I shifted it to 6 till 10. But for the first three months, four months, I was here every day. So 12, 12 to 16 hours a day. Did you ever have a moment where like you didn't know if you'd ever get people in the gym or it just kind of you had connections and it took off well? Um, I thought the connections that I made in the fitness industry would have brought more people in, and they didn't. Uh, out of everyone who I knew, I only brought two people, uh, which I was quite surprised about. But I had an idea that it would work. Um, so the way I based the gym off, I used to work at U of A and uh, in this place called the High Performance Training and Research Center. Um, it's It was pretty much just a gymnasium turned into a gym. Uh, it, it's in the Seville Center. And we had a lot of people calling us saying, can we come and train in there? And all it was was 12 platforms, 30 spin bikes, maybe 20 squat racks, and a cable machine, and some dumbbells. And so many people from the public were like, hey, we love the gym, we walked by, we saw it, we were in there, can we train in there? And uh, the answer was always no, because it, it was only open for varsity athletes. So I knew there was a demand in Edmonton for a, like a high performance public gym. I kind of had an idea. Uh, that it would work. Um, and then I just would 
try and find as many connections while opening the gym as possible. So social media was perfect back then. I just said, hey, this is the gym, tag your friends. Uh, I always ask questions like in, during the construction phase. I would say, hey, what do you think of this green wall? And what do you think of this? Or what do you think of that? Or should we put this here? Should we put that there? And we had a lot of good responses, so it just kind of organically grew. Uh, there was a time, it was month four or five, where I was like, I don't know if this will work. Uh, and I was maybe sad for about half a day. Uh, and then I just realized, okay, well, I just have to work harder. <laughs> and that's really all I did, because yeah. um, I, I, to me, like, if you sulk, it, it's not helping anything. Yeah. If you're like, okay, well, shit's going to happen. Well, I just got to work harder. And if it works, pays off, then great. If not, then I, uh, you can't really do anything else. So, yeah, I just worked harder and it worked out. Makes sense. Yeah. So you have a pretty solid mindset, I'd say. Like, you're good at, like, being self-motivated. What What's your strategy for that? Just, like, work your ass off and just stay focused? Or do you have something that you implement to stay motivated? Um, I really like what I do. Uh, it's really, really fun. The way I describe business to people, and I didn't take any business courses in school ever, but it feels like the Wild West, where like anything is possible. Like, say you want to become venture-backed and get $30 million from a venture capitalist firm. Like, if you could figure out how to make a pitch deck and make a solid sales pitch and do it and somehow end up getting the money. Like, you really could do anything. Uh, so that's the really fun part about it. So that's what motivates me. That it doesn't feel like work. It feels, uh, yeah, like I would. I was telling my wife Leah, like if I didn't have kids or a wife, I just work all the time, because that, that's what I want to do. Because it's just it's just really fun. Yeah. Uh, so that's what motivates me. Uh, from a, do I implement anything? I don't. Uh, I except for the try and do one thing that uh, will work on the business. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, I just try and. Uh, think about other fun ways to make money makes sense makes yeah. sense do you have other fun ways that you make money outside of evolve um yes well yeah i guess um i, I can't do them anymore <laughs> um in between uh opening the gym and uh being at police i loved doing car detailing so nice said, oh okay well i'll polish cars for 500 bucks a car <laughs> and i got a few clients there um, but the way that I, I kind of view it now is um, you have a business, you have all this money coming in, all this money coming out. Uh, what I want to do is I want to try and capture as much money as humanly possible going out that it still goes into my pocket. So you can think of, okay, what are the expenses that are uncontrollable that you can't deal with? So obviously I can't. If I own the building, then I can pay myself in rent. So that's, that's one of the goals. I want to own all the buildings that each franchise has so that it gives um, it gives me more control, but it supports the franchisees even more because I'm the landlord. Uh, I, I know the expectation of how the gym should be. So if a franchisee in Vancouver is dealing with a really crappy landlord, there's a risk that lo that location may close. But if I'm the landlord, I can say, yeah, sounds good. I believe in the model because I built it. So like, keep going, doing what you're doing. We'll collect the rent in the future. So uh, I look at what expenses are going out and try to control them. Marketing, there's one. So you can spend all this money doing marketing uh, on a marketing firm that may not capture what you're doing, or you can try and do it yourself. Obviously, there's a time, uh, return on time, that can you dedicate that much time to actually do it? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, depending on what it is. But I do try and look at every single dollar and say, can I do it myself or can I bring it internally? And that's how I would, that's the fun part of trying to make more money elsewhere. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Did you ever think that you would be like, have a franchise, like have all these evolved locations or was it kind of initially planned to just be one and done? Just one and done. <clears throat> yeah, it, it just one. I never thought of going to. Uh, the only time I considered going to was there was um, people loved it. I'm like, oh, you should open one on the rest side. I was like, oh, interesting. I never even thought about that. And then I did a um, survey, just put it up at the front, and it said, if we were to open a second location, where would you want it to go? And so many people put all these suggestions, 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 and I was like, oh, maybe this actually could work. Um, and um, I thought of just doing it corporately, 
but uh, that would strap me quite financially. So whenever you're owning a business, if you're gonna get a bank loan, it's always against the principles of the corporation. So I have bank loans for this one, and if I wanna do another one, I gotta get bank loans for another one. And um, this mentor that I, I, I uh, hang out with, he said, why don't you try franchising? I had no idea about franchising. So chatting on the phone and just searching, and he's like, oh, there's a franchise expo next weekend. It was like a Monday. It's coming. This this Saturday is coming up. I was like, sweet. Let's go take a look at it. And I'm on the website. And I go, wonder what I can learn from there. And I'll go for their seminars. And there's a seminar called How to Franchise Your Business by a franchise lawyer who is now my lawyer. Uh, so <laughs> it gets, uh, I was like, oh, well, let's go to this seminar. Went to it. He said, this is what you need to do. I've done multiple franchise agreements to turn your business into a franchise. And I chatted with them more. And then now... Uh, I have franchises, so it definitely happened, um, kind of for a reason. Or, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. So, can you tell our listeners exactly how many are projected to open, or even if you just tell our listeners how many are already open for Evolve locations? Because some people might be completely in the dark about Evolve. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the first location opened in uh, twenty fifteen, and then we opened three in twenty eighteen. And um, I have agreements for BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba to put uh, 35 in the next uh, 10 years for that. Um, so sold that region, and then now we're going to look at going into uh, Western or Eastern Canada, so Ontario. So that'll probably take two or three years to actually get the plans set up in place, then we'll start doing that. And then I'll look to go to um, Washington State uh, at the same time. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. What's your ten-year plan for Evolve? Like, what are you a competitive person, or like, is there something that you see for Evolve, like a certain amount of like maybe states or Canada-wide or anything like that? Uh, ten years. Uh, so my my initial goal is to have a hundred locations. Um, I'm projecting, I hope they can do that in 10 years. That's the goal. Wherever they go is wherever they go. Uh, we'll saturate Canada as much as humanly possible and then go to the States. Um, but um, there's more population in the States and there still isn't a model like this there. So I want to move fast because there's nothing proprietary that way we have. So uh, yeah, that'd be the goal. 100 within 10 years. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, with mentors, like who are three people that have really changed your life that you really look up to? Uh, so I there's this mentor. Uh, I, won't, I won't name his name. Okay. Um, he kind of fell into my world. Uh, he was first the client, uh, and then he would just ask me some business questions and go back and forth and. Uh, found out that he's a very, very experienced business guy. Uh, he really assisted me in structuring the business, making it an actual business and not just a small business. Um, so that was, that was very, very beneficial. He's not in the fitness industry and I'm happy that he isn't because it's just business practice that he's good at. Um, obviously there's like business people in the world Everyone always asks, like, who do you listen to? Um, I would say, again, I don't listen to very much. Maybe a podcast every three months. Uh, but I do like Gary Vee. And the only reason why I like Gary Vee is that it's very similar to uh, the way that I think, is that you just got to work. You don't need a special uh, potion or the stars to align. Like, his thing is, I will always outwork everyone. Uh, and really, I think that's all it is. Like, if you put the work in, you'll see the reward. Yeah. You know, a lot of people don't want to put the work in, uh, or they don't hold themselves accountable. Uh, one thing that is also really nice that I like that he said is, everything is his fault. And I kind of take that as well. Um, and actually, what he says, it makes his life super easy. Because, oh, something screwed up? Oh, it's, it's, it's my fault. You don't need to worry about blaming anyone else. You just fix the problem. Uh, so if something goes wrong with a franchise or a trainer, or whatever it is, like, yeah, it's my fault. I'll, I'll just go fix it. Uh, so it's it's actually quite nice of a mindset. Uh, you don't have to worry about uh, this and that and that. It's just you just got to go fix it. You just got to work. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's a good one. So travel. Do you travel? 
Yeah. Um, just went to Hawaii. Uh, me and my wife, we've been to Europe. Uh, traveled there for three weeks to about six countries. We went to Japan uh, about two years ago. Um, I, yeah, I love traveling. What's been the most uncomfortable that you've ever been in a trip? Um, the travel days between different countries in Europe is, is always the worst. Uh, I always get in such a bad mood <laughs> of like going into a new place, having no idea where anything is, if there is English, uh, if there isn't, trying to figure out where to go. Um, you know, technology is great, so it really does help you out. Uh, but just transitioning, it, oh, always try to finding the Airbnb. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes we spend like four hours walking, you know, in a place that's a kilometer in radius, and we know it's somewhere close, but we just can't find it. That's always the worst. <laughs> how has that impacted how you do things when you get back home? Like, I know that when I travel, and like, I'm totally out of my comfort zone, and I learn, like, I usually learn more about myself than anything and then I come back and I just I look at things a different way so I'm wondering if you're the same or if you're different or if, if something's ever changed the way you see things after a trip um not really the only thing that uh like we when we go for traveling uh, we always go for food Ooh. uh so we always try and like the at the say like the night before we're planning our day <coughs> I'm looking at uh, TripAdvisor for the best restaurants or when we went to Europe and went to Japan we wanted to try some Bib Gourmands and uh, Michelin star restaurants so I'm trying to figure out where it is and trying to go there so whenever I always come back um, I remember I love Japanese curry and I tried a couple places here and I went to Japan I tried it and it was incredible and I was happy to go back home and like oh I'm excited to try it again because I really like it and it was the worst thing I've ever tasted and I was like oh like three weeks ago I loved this <laughs> so the thing that always sticks in my mind is just food yeah different types of food and how good it can be prepared and how crappy it can be prepared <laughs> how are you at preparing food are you pretty good at it I would say I'm average oh okay I, I, I like cooking yeah I, I really like cooking um, I'm definitely like I couldn't go into a restaurant and do something but I I, I attempt or I pretend that I am <laughs> what's like your specialty dish like if you had to like if it was like your anniversary or something you had to just like pull out all the all the tricks which which dish would you choose uh, I bought a smoker uh, two years ago I love smoking meat so pulled pork nice yeah that'll win everybody over oh yeah I love it <laughs> just like a just go to a butcher and get like a 14 pound um, pork butt smoke it for like 15 hours I love it. That's awesome. Yeah. So how did you and your wife meet? Um, we went to high school together. And uh, we hung out a little bit in high school. Like very little bit. And then a little bit uh, after high school. She was dating one of my friends. And then uh, once they broke up, we just never talked to each other for about eight years. And then uh, we saw each other at the police walking down the hallway uh, and I was like, what? Is that Leah? Uh, I haven't seen her in like eight, eight, eight or nine years. And um, we saw each other walking down a hallway. And we caught eyes, but she kept on walking. And then I did a full 180. I was staring at her. And I was like, was that Leah Allen? I, I don't know. Like, if it was, she would have stopped and said something. I have no idea what the who it was. Uh, so I went back to my desk. Uh, and I searched her up like with the internet. I couldn't find her on the internet, but then I went on to um, Outlook. I was like, hey, there's a Leah.Allen out of like, EdmontonPlease.ca. So there is someone with this name. I don't. It could be the same person. I don't know. I go, I, uh, go to the bathroom. So thinking how I can figure out who it is. And then I'm walking back and walking to my office. There's another office and she's sitting at a desk. And I walk by it. And then I'm like, oh, I'll just go talk to her. So I, I backwards walked into the <laughs> office and I said, are you Leah? She said, yeah. I was like, do you remember me? Of course. And I was like, oh, crazy. Um, so we started chatting. And um, then we started hanging out. And then I was like, ah. I, I, I always, I believe in fate. Um, so like, I, there's a reason. There has to be a reason I'm meeting her again after eight years. 
I was like, yeah, but you're going to marry her. I said it to myself, like, day four after meeting her again, and I then married her. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't, like, day five or anything, was it? Like, no. How, how much time passed before you tied the knot? Two years. Nice. But, but the really funny thing is she, she tried to break up with me, like, four times. You didn't let her. No. <laughs> You're, no, you don't. It was hard. It was really hard because she had some valid points. <laughs> uh, I just said, no, can't. Yeah, there we go. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So what are your three favorite things about her? Um, she is very smart. She's way smarter than I am. Um, so I, I'm really attracted to how smart she is. Uh, the second one is she is so well-spoken. So... Um, I always sit, tell people, like even my employees, when I like teach them how to chat with people at the front or how to deal with conflict, is um, they th- they say that I'm pretty good at it, and I say I learned it from Leah. But I remember like having conversations or fights with her, where I would be literally quiet for five minutes straight because she would say something, pose a question so perfectly that I would think, okay, if I respond like that, she's gonna say this, and then I'm fucked. If uh, I respond to that, she's gonna say this. So I would have a conversation in my head, for five minutes straight, trying to figure out what to say, and she's just staring at me, blank-faced, waiting for me to say something. So uh, how well she can communicate is the second one. Uh, and the third one is how good of a mom she is. Uh, so we have uh, almost two-year-old, and it's just awesome seeing how, how good of a parent she is. Yeah. That's awesome. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. So how does she make you a better version of you? Um, she, <laughs> so she says that because I'm quote unquote the owner of the gym or the franchise that everyone thinks I'm cool <laughs> 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 or talks to me. And she said, you know, all these people who are just thinking you're so cool and talking to you like you're cool. Uh, she's the one who will never think that I'm cool and always calls me dumb and makes me question what I'm doing because she's like, oh, you're surrounded by yes men all the time. I'm like, I don't think so, but probably I am a little bit. Uh, so she really keeps me in check from that, uh, which is nice. It's hard because she's such so good at arguing that I have a hard time against it, but that's for sure the best thing. Like She's really made me way better at communicating and way better at analyzing things. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. So Evolve welcomes dogs. Are you a dog person? Cat person. Okay. Uh, I, 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 I love dogs. I just, uh, we had a dog. My family had a dog, and I tried to train it. Uh, I just didn't know how, uh, and then we got rid of it. Not, not because I was a crappy trainer, but it just didn't, didn't work. Uh, and uh, I always disliked cats. And uh, Leah's family always had cats. Uh, so I went over, I was like, oh, cats. I don't know. I don't, I don't like these cats. Um, and I just saw how cats were. And um, everyone always says that cats suck because when they go over to their friend's house, the cat just runs away. Um, but they're only seeing a cat at the first time. When you see a cat like the 10th time, the cats are the best because they just sit in your lap all the time. Uh, so I realized this after going over to her house multiple times that cats are pretty cool. So now we have two cats. So if cats come into the gym, you'll be like, all right, it's cat time. <laughs> um, we, when we got our second cat, uh, Leah brought her here, or sorry, him here. And I posted on Instagram, like, should we have a gym kitty? And people were like, yes, yes, yes. And then other people would say, oh, that'd be awesome, but I'm allergic, so I, I couldn't come anymore. And I was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, yeah, if someone's allergic, I don't want them to uh, not be able to come to the gym because we have a cat. So it'd be sweet, but I can't do it, yeah. Makes sense. That's mm-hmm. fair. Yeah. With being the owner of the gym like you would have had lots of criticism or feedback negative feedback like what's the, what's the toughest criticism that you've ever had to deal with um no one ever says it to your face um the toughest there are a lot of people right at the beginning so that said that i would fail and i i heard it through the grapevine it's oh yeah he's a nice guy but and eh, no, it's gonna fail it's gonna fail it's gonna fail um, so it was hard to hear that, but I also could understand why people would say it. Um, other criticism would be, um, uh, you will always hear negative remarks first and positive remarks second. Um, I remember at World Health, uh, we were in this um, life coaching course. And uh, they used this example. There was maybe 15 people in the room. 
and they said, okay, everyone, I want you to think of, as fast as you can, think of the most positive thing that you have ever had in your life. And they said it, and the second you can think of it, you put your hand up. And it took people forever to put their hand up. And they said, okay, sounds good. Uh, I want everyone to think about the most negative or very negative thing about, about yourself as fast as you can. And everyone just shot their hands up as fast as they could. So everyone's focusing on the negative, which is quite interesting. So I would always hear the negative things first. Um, Jim's dirty. Uh, you're not doing this right. You're not helping me this, 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 this. Those are always hard um, because people don't see the back end work of what we're doing to support them or maintain the facility. So that's always tough. Yeah, it's like, uh, you get like negative, 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 negative. Uh, you're doing as much as you can, but it's still not up to par. Um, but you, that's what you have to do. Like, this is the life I chose, so I have to take it. Totally. Mm -hmm. um, so you're a leader to other staff. How do you keep them motivated? Because they're obviously, they're front line and they're going to hear some stuff and it's going to get discouraging because they're putting in the work, they're being consistent. How do you keep them at their best? Um, I always try and build strong relationships with them uh, to know that um, I always have their back. So the way I like to uh, train employees is I want to empower them and give them as much control and, and uh, responsibility as I have. So whenever I say, when I'm not here, you have my responsibility. You are me. So if you deem that you need to ban someone, you, you, you go right ahead. Like, I trust your judgment. You know what I expect. I know how you want the gym. I know that you want. I know that you know what I want. Uh, so I want full autonomy. I'll give you full control. And that, that really helps um, the staff. Because a lot of the times they're, they're, they are alone. And if they don't know that they, they have the power to do things, they may feel lost. So I try to tell them as much autonomy as possible, like, you're me when I'm not here. And that really uh, seems to work. I like that. That's a good way to do things. So if you're doing your own workout and you're planning what you're going to do for your workout, what, what do you choose? What's, what's your workout of choice? Uh, Olympic lifting uh, as the base. Yeah. Because uh, I like the outcome and difficulty of it um, so when you hit a good clean and jerk or a snatch it feels really good so it's immediate feedback and if you do it crappy you'll feel it yeah so it's more of a task uh, it's more of a um, movement you have to master rather than uh, just doing a bicep curl so I'll do that at the beginning to get that and then I will shift to my bodybuilding because it's it's fun yeah I like feeling a good pump yeah. <laughs> I like looking big even though I'm not um, yeah so that's how I kind of do it so I'll let people think first and then like accessory bodybuilding second nice yeah. what's the funnest fitness event that you've ever gone to uh, hmm I really like cycling so I would say the MS bike tour it's a lot of fun yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's uh, 180 kilometers uh, over two days. Yep. Uh, I was really fearful at the first time I did it, so I like overpacked everything. But then when you realize that there's checkpoints every, you know, 15, 20 kilometers, it's really only biking for half an hour. And then you take a break, you drink some food, or just eat some food. <laughs> uh, yeah, drink uh, some whatever, and then uh, you're with your friends. You cycle. You get uh, to the place. It's very. Uh, inspiring you're just yes I did the first day drink some beer party and then do it again that's, that's really fun how many years have you done it for I've done it for uh, four years uh, I didn't do it last year because I had another commitment uh, but I want to do it this year yeah yeah it's cool it's a really good event and then like lots of people in the community get involved with it like I think yeah uh, Michael Dietrich <clears throat> did it last year mm -hmm. and few other people and Patricia yeah. Jahuvka is always really like heavily involved with it being like an MS ambassador yep so it's awesome mm -hmm. what about the event really stands out to you is it like the cycling is it MS in specific or is it just like the style of the event and how it challenges you I like the challenge uh, of cycling that distance um, I like cycling um, because I want to see how strong the engine I can build. 
Uh, I'm not very good at cycling. <laughs> uh, but I do like to see how hard I can push and, yeah. how, and how fast I can go. That's really, really fun. Uh, I never used to like road cycling. I always used to like mountain biking uh, because it's technical, it's fast, it's scary. And then I, I gave cycling a try and I really liked it just of the pure like, let's see how hard you can push. I really like that. I love that there's so many people doing it uh, and it's not just for good or elite cyclists, it's everyone. I guess people on unicycles, there's people who have MS who's doing it, there's people who uh, don't cycle whatsoever, but like I want to do it, support it. Uh, so it's super cool seeing the big variety of people there. Uh, the way it's done, it's it's really well done. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good route, it's easy. Makes sense. Yeah. What's the coolest place you've cycled? Like, do you cycle outside of just the, the MS tour? Uh, just around town. Um, for biking, I love going to Canmore to do mountain biking at yeah. uh, Nordic Center and there are a few other trails there. So I say that's the coolest part I've been for biking. Have you ever Canmore. traveled from Canmore to Banff on that trail? No. It's cool. You should check I, it I out. I want to. <laughs> like once just on a whim, I took my dad's old bike because mine was just rusted. Mm-hmm. I took his and it would only hit one gear. Oh, so wow. So it was like two on the one knob and like seven on the other. But I made it work. Crazy. And, like, <laughs> it's such a good trail. And oh, yeah. you get there, you lock up your bike, you have your beer, you have a burger or something, then you go back. And it's a good, good day trip. Totally. Yeah, I love being out- outdoors. It's great. Well, it's, it's amazing because, like, we take for granted what we have here in Canada. Mm-hmm. Like, all of this nice terrain, atmosphere, space mountains lakes it's great it is like you go saskatchewan sucks like uh, (laughs) i mean saskatchewan is nice i've done like a i've gone with my parents when i was a little kid and we did like the loop around saskatchewan Mm -hmm. but it's just to have all this geography is pretty cool which brings me to my next question for you because you've traveled a bit but is there anything on your bucket list and this could be travel this could be like maybe you haven't bungee jumped before maybe Maybe you want to get a whole bunch of tattoos or something. Like, what what's on your bucket list? If you could list like five things, um, I want to do mountain biking in Whistler. Mountain biking in Whistler. Uh, I want to snowboard in Whistler. I've done that before. I guess that'd be two. Uh, three is uh, bucket list would be I want to own a supercar, and it is I want to own a Pagani. Uh, because if I am wealthy enough to own a Pagani, I know I've made it. <laughs> uh, and that would just be the, the craziest because not many people know what Pagani is. Uh, so just the, the, it'd be so crazy to have a car like that and then to, sh- to show people what it is. Yeah, I've just been nodding my head trying to look cool. What's, what is that? <laughs> uh, so uh, Pagani Horatio is the creator of Pagani and he used to work for Lamborghini. And then he broke off and made his own brand, uh, Pagani. And there's certain vehicles, like there's the C12, there's the 760 RS, which is a super cool car. There's the Cinque, and then the latest one is the Waira. Uh, I would love to own a Waira. That'd be super, super sweet. It's a, they're usually about $2 million. Very, very expensive cars. Uh, but just the craziest cars you can ever think of. Yeah, that'd be something. Uh, what else would I want to do? Um... I want to do a big, a big cycling trip somewhere. I don't know where. Uh, probably the mountains. That'd be cool. Oh, I, I want to do, uh, yeah, Jasper to Banff. Yeah, uh, that'd be really cool, just on a bike. That'd be a good one. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have never skydived. Uh, that'd be cool. Uh, not not on the bucket list, but I think that'd be pretty fun to do. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to Japan. Yeah, eat more ramen. That was great. <laughs> And more curry. <laughs> yeah, that's as I say I would do. What was, aside from food, what was your favorite thing about traveling to Japan? Um, biking in Kyoto. That was awesome. Um, we did it in Amsterdam. Amsterdam is a great, great place to just get a bike. Uh, they actually have more cyclists than uh, motor vehicles there. So it's super nice biking there. It's easy to get around. Uh, in Kyoto, it's very bike friendly as well. So it's just so 
freeing to just grab a, a bike and just pedal around and go to places where you want to go. That was so much fun. That was really cool. I really like the culture of Japan. Um, I love how detail oriented they are. Um, so one of the things I kind of based like the gym off of is super high quality equipment. Um, so <clears throat> I can tell you how much the bars cost. Uh, so the bars that we only use are Leiko. Um, there's powerlifting bars, there's weightlifting bars, 20.5 mil, 29 mil thickness, 20 kg, 15 kg, the stiffness, uh, the PSI rating. I want, uh, I love, love details. So in Japan, it's all about detail, like chef knives, how to um, make sushi, um, how respectful everyone is, um, how much time they take to dedicate to do something. I really like the detail stuff, so that was really cool to see. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. So out of all your training experience because every trainer is going to have like something that teaches them a lesson what's like maybe two or three lessons that you learned in working with a client <clears throat> or just like the day-to-day -day operations of being a trainer um a really really cool thing that i learned when i was at the eskimos uh it was from the athletic therapist chris davy who was with the Oilers uh still he said it's okay to make a client worse before you make them better uh, and that really stuck with me because we're always trying to make them better make them better make them better but when you're testing things out if there's an injury or you're trying to uh, make them better for a sport you're going to introduce some stimuli that may make them worse and hearing that it's okay to make them worse before you make them better was really really nice to hear because it gave me the idea that I can test. I can read something online or grab something from uh, another strength coach and then implement it to see if it works. And if it didn't, that's okay. That was really, really nice. Uh, the second one is uh, I learned it from uh, Ricky Tran, uh, who used to be my old fitness manager at World Health. And he said, um, give, give the client what they want. If the client wants big biceps and only big biceps, you do not do leg day, you do not do back day, yeah. you do biceps until they're blue in the face. Um, and that was good for me to hear. It took me a while to understand it because uh, I was just out of university. I thought, well, the lifting was the best way to train. You, only, you should only do that. Then I realized it doesn't really matter what I want uh, because it's the client. If they want big biceps, they want to be strong. If they want to be weak, whatever they want, you, you give it to them. You're there employing you to provide them with the knowledge that they don't have to achieve the goal that they want not the goal that you want so that was really, really nice uh, and then the last thing that is really important is um, making sure you're not giving yourself away too much like you're not giving you keeping you're keeping yourself yourself uh, I find a lot of trainers will give 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 which is good that you are but they're exposing themselves to too much risk and it comes down a lot to the business side um, make sure you have the systems in place um, to sell to collect money to enforce the stipulations rules regulations contracts that you set because it's only there to protect yourself I know a lot of trainers don't like drafting up contracts uh, between uh, themselves and their clients but I highly recommend that they all do because it gives a very good starting point for the professional relationship between a client and trainer. They have expectations later in the contract to say, you will pay this and in return you will get this. I expect that you will give me a 24 hour notice of cancellation. If you do not, you are subject to a cancellation fee. It sets up the um, framework for a good healthy relationship. Because what happens is when you have long term clients, the personal relationship bleeds into the professional and sometimes it, it overcomes it. So then you might get a client or a trainer uh, trying to take advantage of that personal relationship where if you didn't, if you have a set base of rules or regulations at the beginning that you will always follow, it makes a very healthy relationship. Yeah, I like those, those are good. Mm -hmm. And like, thankfully I've implemented quite a bit of that. So okay. <laughs> that's always nice. Yes. 
So I have a question that I ask every one of my guests, and then after a while, I kind of put it together, put some Coldplay in the background. It sounds pretty cool. Okay. So if you could give one piece of advice <clears throat> on how to live your life to the fullest in the most authentic way, what would that piece of advice be? Um, I would say... Take responsibility for yourself. Yeah, take responsibility for yourself for everything you do. Uh, don't blame others for your misfortunes or benefits, wherever it is. When you take on the responsibility for yourself, it's very, very easy to live your life. Uh, if you begin to blame things um, onto others, uh, you lose power and you lose control. Um, so I've always saw that if there's a failure, it's my failure. If it's a benefit, it's my benefit. Or success, it's my success. Uh, and that made it really easy to live. Because uh, if I um, just blamed, oh, it's because of this, oh, it's because of this, you lose the power of uh, being, being in control. And when you lose, the, lose being in control, uh, I find a lot of people just, uh, they become unhappy. Yeah. If, they, if, they're, if they're uncertain. Like if you're certain that this is what you're doing, it's easy to say, yeah, how's my doing? I'll, I screwed up, I will fix it next time. If you're uncertain that it was your doing, then you're just sitting and waiting for something else to happen. And I think that's very scary for a lot of people. I like that, that's good advice. So thanks for making time for me today. Yeah, it's you're been welcome. a good chat. It was very good. So we'll shoot the shit a little later on, probably. Very good, <laughs> thank you. All right. Hello, it's me again. From the makers who brought you intros to the podcast, I also bring you an outro. So, here's a challenge that I have for you. You got to listen to about 45 to 50 minutes about John, and you might know some things that you didn't know before. Now, I'm curious, who else on the list of guests that I've had is a familiar name to you and... Do you know everything there is to know about them? Better yet, who is on that list that you have never heard their name in your life? Because while everybody is connected in some way, shape, or form, I've thrown a, a few curveballs into my list of guests. Like there are people that are from Chicago or Arkansas, or they were living in Germany when we did the interview, or they're living in Egypt. And no matter what, there's always some kind of a connection, but even more so, it's really cool to see how much you can learn from everybody that you meet, whether they're a professional hockey player or they're a paramedic. They could be a teacher, they could be a professor, they could be a mom, they could be a dad, they could be a young person just starting their career, I think everybody that we meet has something to teach us or some way to support us in whatever thing that we're doing. And that is honestly the overarching goal of this podcast is to make us better at living happier lives. And I mean, if, if, that's, if that's what I'm going to put all this passion into, it'd be incredible to see that grow. Like a, like have somebody listen to one podcast and think maybe I should listen to a few more and have them get something from it. So if you're up for the challenge, it helps me out a ton. Every time that the episode gets shared on social media, another person is more inclined to listen to it because it might not be the most popular podcast, but it's growing and it wouldn't grow without all of the support that everybody gives. So I appreciate the crap out of it. With that being said, thank you, as always, for your support of the podcast. Thanks for lending your ear to me and John and listening to the story. And I hope you look forward to the next episode coming up soon. Thank you.